San Francisco has an empty office problem. And it starts right here, in the core of the city's downtown. There is 27.1 million square feet of empty office space in the city. Early in the pandemic, a lot of office sector workers started working from home. And here we are three years later, many of them are still working from home at least uh, some of the time. All of that has led to a large reduction in the demand for office. We see a lot of companies downsizing. We see a lot of companies not renewing their leases at all and consolidating. Nobody's going to the office. We need more housing supply. Why not just turn all the office buildings into apartments? Not quite as simple as it sounds. Not every office building makes for a great conversion. Not every conversion should be done. Not every building should be converted. Many American offices are sitting empty. New numbers showing 94 million square feet of empty office space in Manhattan. That is an all-time record. Huge investors like Blackstone and Brookfield are staring down defaults in their office portfolios. Meanwhile, finding an affordable apartment can feel impossible, which has a lot of mayors talking. We have a great opportunity to change the mix of uses in the downtown. Make it easier uh, to convert unused office space to housing. So the thing about office to apartment conversions is it sounds like a great idea. Nobody's going to the office. We need more housing supply. Why not just turn all the office buildings into apartments? Not quite as simple as it sounds. Not every office building makes for a great conversion. Not every conversion should be done. Not every building should be converted. In some cities, the laws are making conversions difficult. It was about 3% of the New York stock that we, we saw as being convertible. And that took into account differential of price between offices and, and apartments, which has not actually diverged as much as people may think. But in places that have a lot of older office buildings, there's a lot of conversion activity happening. Some big cities are looking at incentives for developers who convert buildings into housing. Nobody does things in the real estate world out of the goodness of their heart. We have to find ways to either require or incentivize these things to happen. What's stopping cities from converting more offices into apartments? And what challenges do developers face when taking on these massive endeavors? The office conversion trend is heating up in a small group of cities led by Washington, D.C. and Philadelphia. We are right now in the Poplar Building in Philadelphia. The building was built approximately 100 years ago as offices and manufacturing space for Strawbridge's clothiers. It was a giant department store in the last century. This building is one of several conversions conducted by the Post Brothers. Physically, may have had some characteristics that people might think would make for a tough conversion. For instance, it's 100 feet wide by 400 feet long. That means lots of dark interior space. The first consideration for a lot of these buildings is about access to light and air. That's why you see in some situations real creative redevelopment of these buildings where people are driving a core into the middle of the building to allow for additional windows in the middle. We took a building that was a perfect rectangle, carved it into an E. It's extremely complicated. It's expensive. You also have issues of where does the plumbing lines run? And you know, it sounds silly, but you gotta have a bathroom in every apartment or more than one. And if you only have a single line of plumbing or a single area of plumbing, because think about the offices, the bathrooms are only in one part, it's gonna be much more expensive to convert that. Builders call this technique remassing, and it comes in different levels of intensity. The poplar in Philadelphia received a light touch we have units that are 50 feet deep as opposed to the typical you know, 25 to 30 feet deep. We're able to make them work with things like uh, what are called borrowed light bedrooms or interior bedrooms with a light and make really attractive layouts even though the floor plate might not seem ideal. Converted apartments tend to be pricey, much like other real estate in the U.S. In a hot market where there's a lot of demand for housing and a lot of growth, such as Denver or San Francisco, that conversions could potentially address maybe 10% of the housing need. That still leaves the other 90%. And so there's clearly like a need to think bigger about how we're going to build more housing. Back in Philadelphia, the typical household makes enough to afford about $1,300 in rent a month. At the Poplar, 
single bedrooms can rent for $2,000 a month. Then there are projects like The Atlantic, where units can rent for three to $6,000 a month. It was a 1920s Beaux-Arts office building. We finished the conversion in 2019. There, for instance, we made a lot of structural modifications. As an office building, it had old mechanical systems that took up basically the entire roof area. When we're making those major structural modifications, it's to allow for uh, really high quality amenities. The Post Brothers portfolio includes 12 buildings in the Mid-Atlantic with plans for expansion. We're generally 96% you know, occupied at all places and there might be one or two weeks where there's downtime between the old tenant and the new tenant. That's what we call frictional vacancy, so that's really the only vacancy we have. There's a very different story unfolding in office districts. Office vacancy rates are pretty high right now in terms of historical context. The highest that we ever recorded, and that was 19.3% vacancy rate on average. And that was a really stressed period. New York's hovering around 12, 13% right now. That's a bad sign for investors. Well, some of the office REIT stocks have been really hammered, down over 50%, just because of the back to work, which is not going as well as some might have expected. How the streets feel in downtowns has changed a lot in the past three years. Not all of those changes are permanent. It is necessary for downtowns and cities to address that perception. Though many offices are quiet, they're not completely empty. That's a challenge for developers. I think the actual vacancy status or occupancy status is really the single most important uh, prerequisite for conversion, much more so than, for instance, the physical layout, you know, the, the floor plates or, or the systems or anything like that. Um, if there's not a clear path to emptying out the office tenants, it really can't be converted to apartments. When a developer looks for an office to convert, they're looking for certain criteria. For example, older buildings tend to make for better conversions. But the typical U.S. office is newer, bigger, and not vacant enough to be converted yet. These are massive problems for city mayors. We have millions of square feet of unused office spaces that is right now ready to be converted into housing. This just makes sense. Office vacancies also affect government finances. New York City offices generate roughly $6 billion in taxes each year. School districts will tend to rely heavily upon property taxes. The transit authorities like MTA in New York will tend to rely a little bit more on property tax. New York has experimented with office conversions in the past. In the years after September 11th, a wave of these projects rippled across lower Manhattan. We looked historically, and going back to 2000, and, and the number of conversions we were able to identify that did happen in New York, there's 50-something of them, and it turned out to be about 2.5 conversions per year. Well, uh, there's no question that rule changes in Lower Manhattan helped to spur uh, new life in that part of the city. And, you know, the, the result has been a success. The residential population has tripled. That created tens of thousands of new units and really turned the battery and that surrounding area into a residential neighborhood. The government's policies can determine whether or not these projects happen. In Manhattan, commercial buildings generally can take up more space than residential ones. That condition, and many others, can change the financial outlook of a project. So the number one issue in New York is zoning. Washington, D.C., for instance, they have kind of very technocratically thought out the zoning, and you can effectively convert any office building by right to residential. In New York, that's very much not the case right now. And unfortunately in New York, the zoning is dictated at the state level, not the city level. So there's been a lot of fights with, you know, in New York trying to get this change. Um, there's a lot of people paying attention to the issue. This is what it takes to get it done. People are reading through 50,000 pieces of paper to actually get housing built uh, in our city. It's if we have zoning rules and other impediments which are keeping housing from being constructed, shame on us, especially when you are so seriously uh, seeing people suffering in New York City and beyond. In Philadelphia, a 10-year tax abatement brought more development downtown. This policy saved home renovators and investors more than $1 billion in taxes. But just over half of those breaks went to owners of high-value properties. 
If it was a conversion, you basically were taxed on the value of the shell that you bought, but not any of the money you put into fixing it up. So that's been hugely valuable. Post Brothers has two major conversions in the works in DC, where the local government also wants to increase tax breaks for downtown developers. That's Washington. I think that is frankly one of the easier markets. When you look at, for instance, the West Coast markets, San Francisco has the highest GDP per person of any metropolitan region in the country. Uh, office buildings there just four years ago were valued you know, north of $1,200 a foot. Four years ago, it had the highest residential rents in the country, higher than Manhattan. We don't think San Francisco is going anywhere, or there will be a huge opportunity set in downtown San Francisco. Critics of these policies say they're unnecessary developer handouts. Supporters hope the additional supply will calm the housing markets in expensive major cities. The U.S. needs about 7 million more market rate homes at affordable price points for extremely low income renters. The vast majority of people who are eligible to receive housing assistance never receive any. The scale of the problem is much bigger than the resources that most governments at any level are prepared to dedicate to it. You know, there's 500,000 new apartment units needed in New York by 2030 in order to remain kind of an equilibrium between supply and demand. We only forecast 38,000 more per year going up to there, which will fall well short of that 500,000. And it's important that we enable this opportunity for the sake of our commercial office stock and for the opportunity to create new housing. But we do project that over the next 10 years, we could create uh, 10 to 20,000 units of housing. Uh, and that is our best projection. But also we recognize that a lot of this is due to factors, will relate to factors that are well outside our control. Questions like interest rates, questions like an individual property owner's risk tolerance or building layout. So we know that there's real complexity here. Our rules are in the way and we need to fix that. San Francisco has an empty office problem. And it starts right here, in the core of the city's downtown. There is 27.1 million square feet of empty office space in the city. And to put that into perspective, let's take a look at San Francisco's largest building, the recently completed Salesforce Tower. There are nearly 20 Salesforce Towers worth of vacant office space in the city. San Francisco's downtown is among the most vibrant in California and across the country. It's suffering right now. It's emptier than it has ever been in my experience. San Francisco and many other parts of the country, we have seen a significant rise in the amount of vacant space at office buildings. And it's to a point where we have a pretty big surplus and that will take a number of years to be able to work off that excess. We're never going to get back to what we were before the pandemic. We're going to be different. We're going to evolve. We're going to recreate opportunities that may not have existed in San Francisco. San Francisco has close to 90 million square feet of office space inventory, and over 27 million of that is currently vacant. Mayor London Breed has seen this dramatic change while she has been in office. So San Francisco has a vacancy rate right now at around 25%. And before the pandemic, it was extremely low and almost non-existent. The issue started with the pandemic because prior to the pandemic in the city of San Francisco, our office vacancy rate was about 4%, which meant that 4% of all the space, the millions and millions of square feet of space that we had in the city were vacant. And this issue is costing the city a lot of money. How has the economy been affected by the empty office spaces in the city? Well, the economy has had some major impacts. Um, we are facing an over $700 million budget deficit, mostly as a result to the challenges around our empty office spaces, as well as we're seeing businesses close in the financial district. Historically a city that thrived off of commuters, San Francisco is no longer that. It's even referred to as the work from home capital of America, with 46% of workers working from home in 2021. 
up from 7% in 2019. With many workers no longer commuting to the city, the local economy continues to suffer and office vacancies continue to rise. The city is now experiencing its highest office vacancy rates in nearly 30 years. And as leases run out, many companies are opting not to renew. So how does San Francisco solve this problem? One local legislator suggests tackling two of the city's largest issues head on. Well, what we can't do is just leave these buildings empty. Uh, that would be bad for our city's downtown. It would be a total waste. There are some obvious things that we can look at where we can meet some of the other needs that we have and uh, actually solve another problem that we have, and that's our housing crisis. San Francisco is tied with Boston as the second most expensive city in the U.S. to rent ranking behind only New York City, with the median price of a one-bedroom costing $3,000. And the average sale price of a home in San Francisco was $1.35 million in November of 2022. To address this problem, the city has adopted the housing element, which requires 82,000 units of housing to be built by 2031. In order to reach that goal, San Francisco needs to build more than 10,000 units per year starting in 2023. But that's proving to be easier said than done. The system is broken, and I have been trying to work with the legislative body of this city to change it. And sadly, in many instances, most of the members refuse to do so. In the next eight years, we have to build 82,000 units. It's going to require that we make some major changes that I know our legislative body is not going to be open to. But if they don't, what's going to happen State support for affordable housing is going to be taken away, tax credits and all the things that we enjoy to support the ability for us to build housing in the first place in San Francisco is going to be taken away. We have to get aggressive with building more housing, and that's going to take a lot of hard and courageous decisions. With the housing deficit and an office surplus, office to residential conversion could potentially be a long-term solution to address both problems. This is not a simple thing. It's not just you know something you can do for cheap or super easily. It's a challenging thing to do, but it can be done. There are over a dozen cities all over the country that are doing it. From 2016 to 2021, there have been 218 office conversions in the U.S. And so far in 2022, there have been 42 completions with 21 underway. However, 46% of those conversions have been from office to lab, with only 17% being converted into multifamily buildings. The rents that you can get for a, a life sciences lab space are much higher than office space, so it makes that conversion financially viable. We have high demand for residential still, but not at the price that would be required for a developer to do that from a financial perspective. In current market conditions, developers lack incentives to build housing and strict regulatory policies often mean that affordable housing initiatives need to be government-led. In Calgary, Canada, the government is focusing its conversion efforts on housing. The city is working with Gensler, one of the world's largest architecture firms, to revive its downtown core. Calgary was facing a bit of a crisis with vacancy, so they had, a, even pre-COVID, an office vacancy of about 38%. And what that meant was they had around 12 million square feet of empty office buildings, uh, and that was spread across the whole city. But they wanted a way of looking at it to see really if residential conversion was viable, and then if it was, which neighborhoods would benefit from it most. Through an algorithm, Ginzer found that Calgary had about 6 million square feet of office buildings that would be good candidates for conversions. And now the city has started the process of converting its downtown. Ginzer estimates that after the completion of the first batch of office buildings, the downtown population will increase by 24%. There's a lot of cities still talking about it and they actually moved from you know, concept to action in about three months. One of the really interesting things that Calgary did a good job of is just making it very clear and very simple how their program works. It's two things, you go straight to building permit and it's $75 a square foot. Uh, and I can explain it in, in 10 seconds. Calgary is just one of many examples of office conversion efforts taking place today. In the US, New York City, Detroit, and even Kansas City have all launched similar initiatives. So could we see something similar in San Francisco? San Francisco in particular, I think actually has a a real opportunity to do something like this because you have a, a office market which is seeing an increase in vacancy especially around the core and you're actually seeing a housing market that is maintaining strength you know, people have been talking about a housing crisis in san francisco for a long time um, and this is a good way of 
slightly redressing that balance. Has the city received applications to convert specifically from office to residential? Not at this time, um, but we are working and engaging with the business community to help them to understand what is possible. I think that there are a lot of businesses uh, property owners in particular who were not completely aware of how easy it could be to convert. And projects like this have taken place in San Francisco before. We met with Mark Babson, the president of Emerald Fund at 100 Van Ness, an apartment building that his firm converted from an office. We have been developing housing in San Francisco since 1979. 100 Van Ness is a 1972 office tower. 400 feet tall, over 400,000 square feet of office that AAA owned and operated for many years. We took over in uh, 2011 and then from 2012 to 2015 converted the building from office to residential. Emerald Fund undertook the biggest residential conversion in the city to date, building 418 new units of housing and its conversion was largely driven by conditions similar to what we see today. This was an outgrowth of the Great Recession, and for three years they were unable to sign any new leases. And you had a 35% vacancy rate, much like today, in the area, in the Civic Center area. We evaluated what makes more sense, converting the building to residential or keeping it as office. And our analysis said to convert it to residential. While the decision to convert the building was easy, the actual project was a big undertaking. I think it cost us, I think that our construction costs were somewhere in the $125 million range, which is less, much less than it would cost today. We decided to strip down the building. The building was, at that time, 40 years old, and so the mechanical, the electrical, the plumbing, none of those systems were worth salvaging. Office conversions typically take place in older buildings that are often in need of major repair or remodeling. In these cases, developers are already at a point where they are investing dollars into costly upgrades. While an office to residential conversion may require the stripping of a building, in most cases, it's still much cheaper than building from the ground up. We're finding them in general to be about 30% less than the cost of doing a ground up building. Uh, obviously you're maintaining the existing structure, in some cases you're maintaining parts of the existing facade. While office to residential conversions can be a cheaper alternative, many developers have no incentive to build more housing. Strict housing policies often mean that what would have been a profitable project no longer is. The most important thing from a developer standpoint is what makes the most financial sense, what project works. There's a lot of things that, that are standing in the way of converting office to residential. Um, the, the biggest one being that the numbers aren't working today because construction costs are so high. There are things that the government could do to make it easier. When building housing, what are some of the barriers that you see in the city? I think some of the barriers that we see have a lot to do with some of the policies that exist. Additional impact fees, community benefit fees, transportation fees, like you have these laundry list of fees. And at the end of the day, the developer and the people who are investing in these projects, they're gonna make sure they make their money. They pour those expenses into each of the units. Every time we add another fee or another requirement, that's another expense for the average everyday San Franciscan and why I think housing has gotten so out of control, unaffordable uh, in this city. I think also the barriers are the process um, and how long it takes to build housing, uh, all the different requirements. We have so many laws on the books already in terms of height limitations, in terms of open space, in terms of number of units, in terms of everything that you have to do to build and then on top of that we make people go through an insane process which takes an extremely long time. San Francisco already has the highest construction cost in the world with an estimated cost of $350 per square foot for a high-rise apartment. When constructing a new building, developers either have to pay an affordable housing fee of almost $200 per square foot or meet the inclusionary requirements that require a certain percentage of below market rate units. That percentage can be as high as 30%, depending on where construction takes place. Would the city be open to kind of decreasing that percentage of affordable housing to build housing in general? Well, I'm definitely open to it. We need to be open to that. The decision is not completely on me, but I plan to propose some decisions that will help us look at the feasibility, what makes the most sense, what's fair, what's equitable, and how can we get these projects done fast so that we can get this housing built. And that could mean 
uh, lowering the affordable housing requirements for those particular projects to make them desirable. The city has a housing crisis. Do you think it matters what type of housing that we are building or do we just need all housing right now? We just need all housing. And I'll tell you, uh, you know, affordable housing sounds good, but when you go through the process to try and get access to affordable housing in this city, it is hard and it is really, really challenging. And the system that we have tried to repair under state and federal law has been very, very difficult to work under. And so as far as I'm concerned, we need to be as aggressive as we can to get more housing built. The issues are clear and urgent. And with the housing element deadline set for January, San Francisco needs to act quick. San Francisco is a very resilient city and we see things turn around and oftentimes turn around very quickly. Once we work through the economic issues that we have right now, that the demand for commercial real estate could start to grow very quickly. There could be some great opportunities um, in the downtown area, but more importantly, as we see this downtown area uh, start to evolve and more housing get built there, it's going to be a great neighborhood for people to be in all throughout the weekend and the evenings. And so I just think the possibilities are endless, so we'll see. We're going through a little bit of rough waters these past couple of years, but San Francisco will come back strong and I'm, I'm looking forward to the innovative solutions, things like conversion of office to housing, to be part of that, the, the resurgence um, of San Francisco. America's big cities are facing major problems. From sky high interest rates to the reluctance of employees to return to their office. The impact of higher rates and the banking stress is hurting smaller businesses across the country. Many of which can be summed up by a controversial new phrase, the urban doom loop. The environment is certainly shifting on Main Street and it's weighing on optimism. Losses at the bank level, right? There's gonna be losses at the investors level. And I think for the you know, cities, right? They're gonna have this potential, this urban doom loop. Columbia Business School professor Stan Van Neuerberg coined the term. Here's how it all works. Early in the pandemic, a lot of office sector workers started working from home. And here we are three years later, many of them are still working from home at least some of the time. All of that has led to a large reduction in the demand for office. We see a lot of companies downsizing. We see a lot of companies not renewing their leases at all and consolidating. And with this demand decline for office comes declines in the revenues for the owners of those offices and value declines in these offices. Declines in property values reduce property tax revenues for the city. The cities have to balance their budget. They now need to cut spending. That means less money for public safety, for sanitation, for transportation, for education. It makes the city a less attractive place to live. If people migrate out, property values fall more, less money, more people moving out, and the city gets into an urban doom loop where its fiscal health spirals down. At the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, remote work policies prompted many employees to leave their city and move to new states. These population outflows have long-term implications for cities, which rely on tax revenues for funding. Property tax revenue in New York City is about half of all tax revenue. Commercial property tax revenue is about 10% of all tax revenue. So if the value of that falls by 40%, we're talking about a 4% hole in the budget. So if New York City's budget is $100 billion per year, that's a $4 billion shortfall that has to be made up somewhere else. Rich people pay a disproportionate share of income taxes. You know, in New York, for example, a few thousand taxpayers are paying half of all taxes. Migration has become easier because you can leave the city without leaving your job. So if a few rich uh, people or families leave, that could leave a large hole in the budget. The technology sector has been more permissive to remote work, and so those cities tend to be affected the most. You know, think of places like San Francisco, Seattle, the West Coast cities sort of more generally. The urban doom loop isn't just a theory. It's playing out in the real world, with landlords finding themselves financially underwater and regional banks facing a credit crunch. So when I'm a landlord and I want to buy a building, typically I'm going to buy it with a combination of my own money, my equity, and a piece of debt. Because real estate is such good collateral, banks are generally willing to lend a lot of money. So typically there will be 60, 65, sometimes even 75% debt 
and 25% equity, right? So that would be a typical financing structure for a commercial real estate building. And then typically the debt will be fixed rate. The only difference is I'm not paying off any principal, which means that 10 years later when my loan comes due, I need to refinance that loan. Now normally that's not a problem because normally the value of my office will have gone up in these past 10 years. But what if it hasn't? What if the value of my office has in fact gone down? So now the bank will look at that office all over again and reassess it. And it, to the extent it's even willing to give me a new loan, it's going to only want to give me a smaller loan. So now as a landlord, I'm going to have to make a tough choice. Either I come out of pocket and put more money into the deal because the loan that I'm getting now is smaller than the one I need to repay from 10 years ago. So I put in more equity in the deal or I walk away and I have the right to do that. I can send the keys to the lender. And, and just walk. A lot of the debt is non-recourse, which means the bank has no recourse to my other assets. I can just simply take this one office building that I've borrowed against and just send the keys to the bank. The bank now owns the building. So banks are facing this deterioration in, in, in basically the credit quality on these commercial mortgages that they have on their books. So these smaller regional banks that have done a lot of local commercial real estate lending, they're now tightening the screws on the credit for the local non-real estate firms as well. That is sort of a traditional credit crunch. Commercial real estate is a very large asset class. There's about $5 trillion of commercial real estate out there. And whether you know it or not, you know, you, your uh, pension fund might very well have an exposure to commercial real estate directly or indirectly. There's also a part of the equity market called the REIT market, which is the publicly listed real estate space. And again, a lot of folks have exposure to that through a mutual fund, through an exchange traded fund, and those REITs especially the office REITs, have fallen on hard times in the last several years. Their stocks are often down 50, 60, 70 percent sometimes. Occupancy of office getting to 30 percent below pre-pandemic levels. The office sector certainly is going to experience more pain than any other sector in the next two to four years. With only a small percent of desks occupied around the world five days a week and trillions of dollars of commercial and office debt about to come due in the next couple of years, it really makes you wonder how it's all going to shake out. So are we really doomed? Or is there a way for cities to pull themselves out of the loop? The fundamental problem is that we have too much office. The only solution in the long run is to get rid of some of the excess office we have and repurpose some of that space. The solution you hear about the most is apartments. Turns out that that's easier said than done because a lot of our large offices are very big buildings. You know, by my own calculations, only about 10% of office buildings are physically suitable for conversion to apartments. But that's just one of the options. You could think about more medical office space. You could think about more entertainment spaces, more hotel space. There's a lot of creative things we could do with the land. This is nothing new. Cities have always reinvented themselves throughout the ages. And it's now basically our next challenge is to get rid of some of that defunct office space.